You can open up your Bible, I guess, to uh, the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3 this morning. We'll get there in a little bit uh, in 1 Samuel. But um, the relationship between a father and his children can closely be compared uh, to our relationship with our God, right? Uh, I always love the dynamics of the family because if you look at the relationships within the family, you always get to see a, a glimpse or a little glimmer of, of what that relationship that God desires to have with us, right? We're the bride of Christ, you know, and you get to see that within the marriage. Uh, and this morning, as it is Father's Day, happy Father's Day to all you guys. Uh, we will obviously be looking at the relationship between a father and his children and also what that relationship looks like between our heavenly father and also us uh, as his kids. And I just love how God expresses that with us. And again, uh, as I stated, you know, we had our first baby 11 weeks ago tomorrow, uh, baby Luke. Most of you guys know that. And uh, it's just such a blessing to uh, have a son, but to not just have a son, but it's definitely a blessing to also be a father, you know, and there's definitely a difference. Um, but it is, it's so neat just to have the joys uh, of having this baby in our house, uh, the smile that he gives us in the morning, uh, all the laughs that he has. We were sitting over here with Alan and Miranda, and he's just cracking up and laughing and smiling and stuff. And you guys know if, uh, if you've had a chance to sit down with him, he's just such a happy baby. And it's just such a blessing from the Lord. And, you know, one of those joys that we get as fathers is when people say, that your child looks like you, right? Oh, your baby looks just like you. You know, when, when Luke was first born, everyone would tell me that. Oh, your baby looks just like you, Roman. He's your, your mini me there, you know? And then I realized that they were just being nice. My baby doesn't look like, at least I don't think so. I think he looks exactly like his mom. That is a Filipino baby right there, you know? Big old eyes, just beautiful kid, and I think he looks just like his mom. But that's one of the joys that we get as parents, right? When our children resemble us. And in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27, we're not going to read it, but God uh, says that he created us in his image, right? We were created in the image of God. And God created us to resemble him, if you think about it, right, as his children, as his kids. In a sense, he wants us to be his mini-me, right? This is what our God, uh, the image of God is. And it gives God great joy as our heavenly father to hear that when his children look like him, when his children resemble him, when we have the same characteristics or the same attributes uh, of our God. And God carries Many attributes that he wants to pass along to us uh, as children. And just like an earthly father, he wants to uh, pass along his likeness, his hobbies, you know, the things that he enjoys to us. Uh, I can't wait till my son is old enough uh, when I can pass along my 1989 Topps baseball card collection that I've been collecting since I was a kid, you know, 80, 90% of it done. And uh, he's going to get that collection. He's going, wow, dad, thank you so much. This is so awesome. 1989 tops. Wow, tell me all about it, you know. And then he's going to grow up a little bit and look, up, look it up and see that it's only worth about 30 bucks or so. And, you know, maybe he'll still be excited, but, you know, it's just the sentimental value behind it, right? But God wants us to enjoy the same things that he enjoys. And he takes great pride uh, when we resemble him as his kids. He, uh, you may remember what he said about Job in Job chapter 1, verse 8. It says, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And I love just listening to how God describes his child Job. We see this father taking pride uh, in his child here. And this morning, we're going to look at four characteristics that a heavenly father desires to pass along to us as his children. Four characteristics that God possesses that he has and that I believe that he wants us to have as, uh, as fathers. And our first characteristic Again, if you're taking notes, note these down. Our first one is that he disciplines. 
he disciplines. Our God is a God that disciplines, and he desires us to be fathers that discipline. If you'd like to read about God being a disciplinarian, you can read Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 through 9. Our second characteristic or point is that he gives great gifts. Our God gives great gifts, and that's found in James 1, 17. Our third is he is faithful. He is a faithful God, and a father, a godly father, is faithful as well in Deuteronomy 7, 9. And our fourth and last point is that he is holy, First Samuel 2, 2. All things that God is and all things that he desires a godly father to be as well. And throughout the Bible, we get to see many different fathers, right? We see a lot of different fathers throughout the word. Some uh, great examples of what a godly father is, some that we can just learn from and learn by and just, you know, love to read about. Uh, And then we have other fathers as well that we would more so learn from their mistakes rather than their successes, right? Uh, Some men that struggled to be fathers, yet we're still great men of God. And that's encouraging to me as a father because it just tells me that, hey, even if I mess up, even when I mess up, you know, God is not through with me. He's not finished. And he still has a purpose and a plan for me as a father. Some great men of God that uh, we may have forgot were not the best fathers would be one Eli, Eli, uh, we're going to look at in a little bit here. He was not the greatest father. Uh, Another one was Samuel. Samuel was not uh, a great father. David, whose son tried to kill him, you may remember, in Absalom. Uh, We even have, I would say, Adam as one of Adam's sons. Cain killed his brother Abel. Uh, There were some things there that maybe Adam uh, had failed in or could have done Better, But then we find fathers to follow, fathers that uh, were just great examples of godly men throughout the word. And one that I love is Noah, right? Noah was a great father, I think, and we're going to look at him as well in a little bit here. We have Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob or Israel was a great father. And then also, I think one that we look over many times would be Joseph, uh, the father of Jesus, I think Joseph was a great father, though not much is written about him. So our first characteristic of a heavenly father is he disciplines. He disciplines. God is a God that disciplines, and he desires us as fathers to be fathers that discipline. Hebrews twelve eleven says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. I don't know about you, but I was never one that really liked discipline, right? I don't know about you guys, but I never liked discipline as, uh, as a kid. In fact, I tried to stay away from discipline as much as I could. I tried to talk myself out of it. And I still do today with my wife, right? She's not in here. So, oh, there she is. Hey, honey. So, you know, we, we don't like discipline, you know, as uh, uh, maybe as much uh, as we should or as much as it is good for us. Um, in fact, when we were kids, I remember uh, when we would get in trouble, and you guys know I have three brothers, so we would get in trouble uh, quite often. And, and if it wasn't one of us and it was the other, and my dad would always tell us, hey, you know, uh, you know, after my mom said, wait till your father gets home, we got that speech plenty of times, you know, the dad would get home and it would be, hey, go to your room after dinner, lay down on your bed and you wait for me to go in there. And when I get in there, uh, you're going to get a spanking, you know, for what you did today, for what went on. And uh, some of my brothers who also didn't like discipline, uh, they would, before he would go in there, they would take socks and roll them up and they would put them in their pants so that when my dad would come in with the belt, uh, they were able to soften the discipline, right? They, would able, they were able to get out of the discipline. I never did that, but uh, a few of my brothers I know did. So afterwards, you know, I think my dad still owes them a few, so we're going to hold them down, and then we're going to uh, catch up on those whoopings. No, we're not going to do that. But we always flee from discipline, right? Um, though we're always looking to get out of discipline, uh, I think the older we get, the more thankful we are for that discipline in our lives, right? In the first four chapters of 1 Samuel, 
uh, we find a priest named Eli. And Eli being a priest, uh, his life was obviously dedicated to the work of God. He uh, lived at the tabernacle in Shiloh. Uh, From there, he was a child. He grew up learning the laws of Moses, learning the Jewish traditions, the order of the sacrifices. Uh, He really learned uh, the Jewish tradition as they went through the Torah and the laws that God had established for them. Eli even raised his family in the tabernacle Uh, He got an opportunity to raise a young boy named Samuel, you may remember, as his mother Hannah dedicated him to the Lord. Uh, But even Eli, being a great man of God, lacked the godly discipline that was needed for his own children. In in 1 Samuel 3, 9, it speaks about Eli's great faith. You may remember the story as Samuel is about to go to bed, he he hears his name being called over and over, right? Samuel, Samuel. After Samuel gets up a number of times, he runs into Eli and keeps asking Eli, uh, Eli, yes, you called me. And Eli tells him, after the third time, he says in 1 Samuel 3, 9, he says, go lie down and it shall be if he calls you that you must say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And it was the discipline or the training that a son would be looking for in a father that Samuel found there in Eli. But there was only one problem. Samuel was not Eli's son. Uh, Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And it was, uh, it's sad to me when someone is willing to pour into children uh, other than their own. You know, they're able to pour in or minister to people, yet when it comes to their own children or their own family, there's a lack of discipline. And in uh, chapter 2, uh, of First Samuel, verses 16 through 17, it speaks about the corruption of Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. And read with me in verse 22 of chapter 2. It says, Now Eli was very old, and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel. And now they lay, uh, how they lay with the women who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all the people. Know, my sons, for it is not good, it is not a good report that I hear. You make the Lord's people transgress. If one man sins against another, God will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who will intercede for him? Nevertheless, they did not heed the voice of their father, because the Lord desired to kill them. Eli had dedicated many years to the Lord's work, many years to the ministry of God, but it was the years of the lack of discipline for his children that had hardened uh, the hearts of his two sons. And at this point, Eli tries to reason with his two sons, uh, Hophni and Phinehas, but uh, Eli waited too long. Uh, He waited until, it says there in verse 22, until he was very old. How important it is for us as fathers to start discipline uh, at an early age, right? Uh, And this is God's desire for us, though not easy. Uh, Really, it's from day one that uh, we need to start discipline, right? That's what I'm learning. And, and, uh, you know, our children, though, they don't like it. You know, Luke fights it every time I try to put him in the corner. You know, he tries to get out of it. But uh, I just keep reminding him, who's dad? I'm dad. Who's dad? I'm dad. Who's dad? I'm dad. And he usually just laughs at me, you know. But I'm training him from day one is the point, you know, that he would be uh, a godly son, that he would know that I am a father that desires to follow the Lord and to take on the characteristics of God. In 1 Samuel 2, 29, God asked Eli the question, why do you kick at my sacrifice and my offering, which I have commanded in my dwelling place. And honor your sons more than me, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people. God is a God that disciplines, and he desires men or fathers to be fathers that honor him more than their own children, right? Uh, Being a a good father or a godly father or parent, it doesn't mean that you're always making sure that your child is happy, 
or satisfied, but it means that you're always making sure that your child knows the difference between right and wrong, that they always know uh, what is right in life and where that uh, righteousness or that right comes from. It means that you put God first and that your children would learn also to put God first. When I put God above Luke, though I think Luke is the greatest thing, you know, Luke, our children, even uh, can become even our saviors at times, right? We think they're just the greatest thing to ever exist. You know, Luke can do no wrong. Luke makes me laugh and smile when I come home from work, you know, but Luke can be put in that position in my life uh, above the Lord. And Luke has to know, he has to understand uh, that God comes first. Because if Luke knows that God comes first in my life, then Luke also will put God above Luke in his life. Proverbs 3.12 says, For whom the Lord loves, he corrects. Just as a father, the son in whom he delights. See, we don't always agree or enjoy discipline, right? Hebrews said that we don't enjoy the chastening in the present. When it's going on, we're not enjoying it usually uh, when it's happening. But Proverbs says that it's in that discipline that love is found. Proverbs says that for whom the Lord loves, he corrects. And it's through the correction, it says that a father finds delight in his children. Uh, As a father, I hope that my son will see the love and the discipline that I have for him uh, through that discipline that I have for him as he grows older. God takes no pleasure in that discipline. He doesn't take pleasure in the correction, but he takes pleasure in what the correction creates in our lives. He takes pleasure in what the discipline uh, creates as we grow older. Job 5.17 says, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. And I'll tell you what, I am a happier person, I believe, as an adult because of the correction that I received as a child from my father. The next characteristic that we're going to look at from our Heavenly Father is that He gives great gifts. Our Father gives great gifts. You can turn to Matthew chapter 7. We're going to read verses 9 through 11. Our Heavenly Father gives great gifts. Verse 9 of chapter 7 says, For what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread will give him a stone? Verse 10, Or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask? You know, my son right now, He eats every three hours, right? Every three hours, you know. uh, I passed on a lot of characteristics, I believe, to him. One of them was uh, getting cranky when you're hungry, right? Like most guys. So every three hours he gets hungry, he wakes up, and you hear that first whimper, and you know what's coming next. Full-blown crying, you know. And you think to yourself, why did I not heat his, his bottle up sooner? You know, why did I not get it ready right when he woke up? And what kind of father would I be if when I heard him begin to cry or begin to whimper, uh, I looked at Luke as he's laying there and I handed him a rock. Here you go, son. Here's a stone. Is that what you're looking for, buddy? This will satisfy you. You're just, you know, suck on it for a little bit. You know, hold on to it. Hold it tight. You know, what if during that time that he was crying, I picked up a snake and I threw it in his lap? Here you go, buddy. Just play with that snake for a little while, you know? I wouldn't be a very good father. That would never even cross my mind. And yet, in all my imperfections, in all my sin, in all my, you know, just all the, the junk that we have as, as, uh, as men, you know, I know I can still see what my son needs and what is good for my son. And what Jesus is saying here in Matthew is how much more then can our father who is in heaven, our heavenly father, uh, how much more can he see the good gifts, the good things that we need in life, being perfect in heaven. In Genesis chapter 37, we read about Jacob. And uh, Jacob gave a special gift to his son. You may may remember, if you'd like, you can turn to Genesis 37 with us. If not, it's okay. In verse three, it says, now Israel loved Joseph 
more than all his children because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. And you guys remember the story of Joseph. Jacob had 12 sons. And Joseph, it says here, uh, had a little favoritism from his father. And it wasn't easy, I'm sure, for Joseph uh, being the favorite child. I would know. It's, it's not easy, you know. It's, you, you, look, you get looked down upon a lot of times, you know. And uh, Joseph, he had this, this, uh, this blessing, yet this curse at the same time from his father, uh, Jacob. And it says that he was a son born in his old age. And there was just something special about Joseph uh, to his father, uh, Jacob. And he, Jacob, it says, made a tunic or a coat for Joseph of many colors. And this tunic was very special. Uh, yes, everyone had a coat back then. But most people's coat was made specifically for uh, that purpose of keeping you warm. You know, that was pretty much it. To keep you warm, they would also hold things within their coats. And that was about it. But this coat was different. This coat was beautiful. This coat had style. This coat uh, uh, was full of color, color that was usually reserved for royalty. This coat, they believe, uh, could have been ankle length rather than most coats that stopped at the waist alone. Uh, this coat could have had long sleeves that translation could point to. Uh, and again, very uncommon for that time for a coat to have long sleeves. Most coats had short sleeves. It could have been embroidered or striped with various materials or fabrics, you know, like fine wool or silk. Uh, Joseph's father knew how to give good gifts, right? And I'm sure Joseph loved wearing that coat. And you might say, well, that's not fair. You know, that's not fair for Joseph to receive the, the gifts from his father. Well, it is if you're the one receiving the gift, right? It is if you're the one that, that's getting the favor to, hey, you know, you have nothing, no problems with it. And our father gives great gifts. He loves giving those things that, uh, that, just, uh, that we will just enjoy to us. James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights in first corinthians 12 7 through 11 you can turn there if you like it speaks about the gifts that god has given to you and to me as believers we're going to read first corinthians 12 7 through 11 it starts off in verse 7 saying but the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings and, and the, by the same Spirit, verse 10, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Wow, what great gifts God has given to us. It says that he's given us wisdom. He's given you wisdom. He's given you knowledge, faith, it says healings, miracles, the gift of prophecy, discernment, and the gift of tongues. God knows how to give great gifts. And James 1.17 says that it's perfect gifts. Eventually, this coat from Jacob would be a target on Joseph's back every time he wore it with his brothers. At the same time, uh, this gift would also play a huge part in fulfilling God's plan for Joseph. It was that gift, remember, that got him bound and thrown into a pit, waiting to be sold into slavery by his brothers. It was uh, that gift that was torn into pieces and dipped into goat's blood and sent back to his father, as they said that a wild beast or animal uh, tore Joseph into shreds. It was that gift that God used to get Joseph over to Egypt. And it was that gift that set Joseph up uh, with the ability to save his family in that position during a time of famine as it swept across the land there. A lot of times we take these gifts for granted. 
A lot of times we look at the gift and we just think, wow, what a coat, what a gift, not really realizing the reason behind the gift, the plan that God has for us. Cling to the gifts of God. Be a father that gives great gifts to your children and be children that expect great gifts from your heavenly father. How are we expecting those gifts from God? Do we come to church expecting to hear from the Lord, expecting to receive what he has prepared for us? Matthew seven eleven says, remember, it says, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who what? Those who ask, those who ask him. Ask your father for those good gifts. Our third characteristic this morning is he is faithful. He is a faithful Father, he is a faithful God and he desires us to be faithful fathers. Deuteronomy 7, 9, we'll go ahead and read it. It says, therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. It says that your, the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God. God. In Hebrews 11, we see the hall of faith, right? And in verses 8 through 19, we see a man named Abraham. And Abraham's story is a great story of a faithful father or, or a father filled with faith in his God. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, God made a promise to Abraham. You can turn to Genesis 12, 1 through 4 if you'd like. God makes this awesome promise uh, to Abraham. Uh, in chapter 12, 1 through 4, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 70 years old when he had departed from Haran. There was nothing special about Abraham. He was uh, the ch- uh, one of four children. He migrated with his father Terah to the land of Ur And from Ur, leaving to uh, the land of Canaan. And as God uh, appeared on that trip to Canaan, to Abraham, he makes a few promises to him. And it was God's faithfulness, as it says in Deuteronomy 7, 9, it says, because he is God and he is faithful, that Abraham could rest his faith upon. Uh, Did you get that? Because God is faithful we can have faith in him. And that faith that we have in God can turn into faithfulness. It can turn uh, into reliability on our part. It can turn into commitment. It can turn into faithfulness because we know that we have a faithful God. We know that we have a God that that will never fail us. You know, I always love the story of a man named Charles uh, Blondin. You might know the story as, I, as, as I'm about to read it here. And uh, My dad used to always use this story in his sermons. And uh, being Father's Day, I guess I'll go ahead and, and use it as well. Uh, it says this, The amazing story of Charles Blondin, a famous French tightrope walker, who is a, uh, is a wonderful illustration of what true faith is. Blondin's greatest fame came on September 14th, 1860, when he became the first person to cross a tightrope stretched 11,000 feet over a quarter mile across the mighty Niagara Falls. People from both Canada and America came from miles away to see the great feat. As he walked across 160 feet above the falls several times, uh, each time with a different daring feat, once in a stat, in a sack, on stilts, on a bicycle, in the dark and blindfolded. One time he even carried a stove and cooked an omelet in the middle of the rope. A large crowd gathered 
and the buzz of excitement ran along both sides uh, of the river bank, and the crown oohed and awed as Blondin carefully walked across, one dangerous step after another, pushing a wheelbarrow, holding a sack of potatoes. Then at one point he asked for the participation of a volunteer. Upon reaching the other side, the crowd's applause uh, were louder and louder, and they grew even louder than the falls themselves. Blondin suddenly stopped and addressed his audience, Do you believe I can carry a person across in this wheelbarrow? Blondin asked. And the crowd enthusiastically yelled, Yes, you are the greatest tightrope walker in the world. We believe. I like that. You are the greatest tightrope walker in the world. We believe, they said. Okay, said Blondin. Who wants to get into the wheelbarrow? As the story goes, no one at that time got into the wheelbarrow. How strong was their faith in Charles Blondin? You know, I might have 70% faith. I might think he can cross it maybe 70% of the time. I might think he can cross it 80, 90% of the time he's going to be faithful in crossing over that tightrope. You know, but if I was 100% sure that he was going to make it every time, I'd have no problem getting in that wheelbarrow. You know, the problem is their faith in his faithfulness, right? And a lot of times that's true with our Lord. If God is 100% faithful, I should have no problem putting 100% of my faith in him. Hebrews 11, 8 says, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Let me read that again. By faith, Abraham believed. It was Abraham's faith that allowed Abraham to be faithful. Abraham had no idea where he was going. God just called Abraham out. He said, Abraham, come follow me. Abraham, get into the wheelbarrow. And Abraham knew that God was 100% faithful and he had no problem putting his trust in God. Verse uh, eight of Hebrews 11 says, by faith, Abraham believed. Abraham's faith turns into faithfulness. Why should we be faithful to God? Why should we be faithful fathers? Why should we uh, be trustworthy and reliable? Because we know that our God is 100% reliable. We know that he'll never lead us astray. He'll never fail us. And we know that we can trust in the plan that he has for us as his children. Our fourth and final characteristic is he is holy. He is holy. He's a holy father. He is a holy God. And he desires us to be holy Fathers, First Samuel 2.2 2 says, No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. No one is holy like the Lord. There is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. And First Peter 1.16 says, It is written, Be holy, for I am holy. What does it mean to be holy? What does that mean? Holy means to be sacred, to be physically pure, to be morally blameless, to be consecrated to the Lord. How can a father be holy? And you might be saying, you know what, Roman? I was with you on discipline. I got that down. You know, I have the great gifts down. I can, I can go get some awesome gifts. You know, even the faithfulness, I can be a faithful father. But holy, how can I be a holy father? How can uh, holiness be obtained? In chapter 5, of the book of Genesis. Again, if you'd like, you can turn there. If not, it's okay. We meet a man named Noah. And I love the story of Noah. In chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, it says this, Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. And skipping ahead one chapter to six, verses five through nine, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart 
was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and the birds of the air. For I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God. During that time, it says that the world was completely wicked, a completely wicked place. Every uh, thought of man was only evil continually, it says. Everybody other than Noah, there stood Noah. In verse five, it says that every intent of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil. How did Noah, in the middle of an evil world, in the middle of this, e- of these evil, uh, this evil generation, keep himself holy with absolutely no example? In chapter six, verses 14 through 22 of Genesis, God gives Noah the instructions on how to build what? The ark, right? God gives Noah these, uh, this instruction. And building the ark, it wasn't easy. It took a lot of lumber. It took a lot of labor. And most importantly, it took a lot of time, right, on Noah's part. And in uh, 6.22, it says something interesting. We find this reoccurring theme throughout Noah's life uh, there in Genesis, it says this, and it, and, it, and it gives us the answer that we are looking for in staying holy. It, ga- it gives us the answer uh, that Noah found. Are you ready? It says, thus Noah did. Did you get that? Let me read it again. It says, thus Noah did. Thus Noah did. It says, according to all that God commanded him, so he did. Noah found the answer to being holy. What was the answer? The answer was to do all that God had commanded him. And we might think that that's easier said than done, right? Man, how can I do all that God has commanded us? It sounds pretty difficult. You know, but I think it's harder to follow the instructions to redeem a rebate, honestly. You know, there's $500 million left every year in rebates, unclaimed. If you want to start a business, start a business filling out rebate forms for people. And then give me 5% for the idea. You know, I think it's harder to apply for health insurance. I did that twice in the last six months with this baby. All the forms that you have to read through and understand and go back and make decisions on. You know, if I was to win a million dollars would I make sure to understand and follow the directions? I probably would, right? And yet the prize that God has for us is so much more valuable than a million dollars. How much more effort should I put in to understanding God's commandments for me, to understanding those instructions that he has for me as his child? I think God has made it really easy for us to follow his word. I think if God was in charge of the DMV, there'd be no lines, no f- extra forms to fill out, no automated phone system, you know, to dial into and you kept getting looped back to the first, you know, number or whatever. He's made it so easy for us. And Noah found the answer and that was to just simply do what God commands him. Matthew 22 verses 37 through 39, it says, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, and with all your mind. Jesus sums up the whole law. He sums up all the laws that he had written in the Old Testament in these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And he says that the second is like this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. If you can just do those two things, You are good to go. You are good to go to be holy. Noah looked to his father in heaven as an example to be holy. And like Abraham, 
And many fathers, Noah still messed up, right? If you know the story of Noah, right when he was done keeping himself busy, what did he do? He went out and got drunk and he made a fool of himself. But it's in those times when we mess up, when we feel like, man, I blew holiness, that Jesus would say, my grace is sufficient for thee. See, holiness as a believer, it doesn't scare us, right? It actually comforts us. It's actually comforting to be holy because we know that in those times that we mess up, that we're covered by the blood of Jesus. It's in those times that we fail as a father, we know that God has completely covered us. Matthew 26, 28 says, For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission or the forgiveness of sin. And that is the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. You know, one day uh, I will fail Luke. One day that cry is going to come and guess what? I'm not going to have his bottle ready, you know? He's going to look to dad and there's going to be that mess up that comes along. But it's in those times that Luke has to look to God. It's in those times that he has to look past me and look to the father and that he'll find all the answers to the questions that he has. Our God is a God that disciplines. Our God is a God that gives great gifts. Our God is a God that is faithful And our God is a God that is holy and he desires us to be fathers that are the same. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, I just uh, thank you, God. We thank you, Father, for just being such an awesome father. We thank you, Lord, that though we fail our sons, though we fail our children, though our fathers have failed us at times, even as great as men that they are, We thank you, God, that in those times that we can look to you, our Heavenly Father, and we know that you are 100% reliable, 100% faithful, Father. I ask God this morning that if there is any father in this room that feels like they have failed, that feels like they have messed up, that feels like uh, they should have done a better job, we pray right now, Father, that you would just intercede on their behalf, Lord, that you would comfort God, that you would bring the answers, Lord, that they're looking for, God, that you would be that faithful father that they need first off and that they would still, uh, at this point, as it is never too late, that they would look to your word to shape and mold them to be that father that they can be to children, to grandchildren, Lord, even to great-grandchildren. Father, we just pray right now, Lord Jesus, also that if there is anyone in here that does not know you, Lord, that has never accepted you as their father, as their savior, then we ask, Lord Jesus, that they would just simply ask, Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of those times that I've messed up. Be my father. Be my God. Be my savior. I don't know where you're calling me. I don't know what you're asking me to do. But I know that you're always right and I know that your plan is the best plan in my life and I want to follow you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for this morning and we pray all this in your name. Amen, amen. After the song here, of course, we're going to have a few up here for prayer as well. If you prayed that prayer, please come forward and get additional prayer. Also, if you just need prayer for something else as well, feel free to come forward. Thank you.